The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Those of you who have followed Mystery Theater through the years must by now, like Hamlet, be convinced that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophies. And the more science advances, the stranger and stranger are the things it cannot explain. The following is a true story, most of which is documented. Only some of the names have been changed to protect those still alive. Can you see a leather mass over me, Gil? Thick as pea soup and black as bean? Over. Negative. Billy. Over. It's, it's weird. I, I got this black mass sitting right over me, and below the sea's gone all white and choppy. Over. You hold on and keep circling. I'm coming your way. You read me? Over. I read you loud and clear, but you better contact center. I'm really getting uh, bounced around. Uh, I, I, I don't know what's going on here. mystery drama, Window to Oblivion, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Russell Horton and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. December 15th, 1945, after coming through World War II unscathed, if anyone had told Marine pilot Lieutenant Billy Howard this was his last day on Earth as a living human being, he would never have believed them. Only his wife Joan, out of some deep psychic sense, which later was to be an important element of this story, had any advance warning. But even there, because Joan was younger and because the circumstance that was to separate them was so strange, the signal was garbled, jumbled, and not strong enough for her to recognize its shocking import. This is how it all began. Hey, lazy bone. Mm, oh. Roust it out. What, who, uh, oh. <laughs> hey, it's broad daylight. What, what, what time is it? Ease up, darling. No sweat. It's only nine o'clock. Oh, thank heavens. Well... Well, then what's the big hurry? I'm not due at the base till noon. That's when the Marines repossess you, darling. But for this morning, after I feed you, you remember you were all mine? We're going on a little shopping spree for the loving wife? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot about that for a minute. Hey, how about the war being over and just nice to talk about normal things? It's been over for a few months. And it is about that time. Ooh, what time? To talk about normal things. Oh, Billy, I really don't care about the shopping. That's just a symbol. Oh, I do. I want my wife to be dressed as gorgeous as she looks. I would give up an all-year-round wardrobe to know my husband wasn't going to be dressed the way he is anymore, no matter how gorgeous he looks. Honey, looked. I still haven't piled up enough points to get separated from the service. The moment you do, I want you to. Please. Oh, I don't know. It's... It's a pretty good life, Joan. I've put in quite a bit of time learning to be a Marine pilot. We might do worse. No. No what? I just... I don't want you flying anymore, Billy. Joan, darling, you never acted like this before. All right, I know. I, I, I just have this feeling... Will you be going up today? Well, sure, but it's just a routine scouting flight. Scouting for what? Oh, come on, Joan. What's gotten into you? Oh, Billy, I don't know. It, it started last night. I have this obsession that if you go up on this flight... I don't know. I just feel like you're never going to come back. Hey, come on. What goes? It's like somebody is trying to send me a message, only I'm too stupid to understand. Darling, do you have to report today? I'll tell you what. Let's go buy you a new wardrobe and get you all set, and then we'll start to worry about me. Here we are. 
are, fly boy. And there you are, sweetheart. Boy, that's a pretty smashing outfit I made you clothe your beautiful body in. I think it's smashing, too. <laughs> if you'll just come back to enjoy it. Okay, come on. Now, let's stop with a crepe hang. I know I ought to be ashamed, but I can't help it. Billy, I'm scared. Of what? I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's what we're all scared of, isn't it? The unknown. Well, that's not where I'm going today. Where are you going? If it holds true to custom, the same few hundred square miles of Atlantic that I keep tracking day after day till I have a hard time staying awake. Where? Northeast from Fort Lauderdale to Bermuda, square off southwest for a leg, and then back due west to base, just defense patrol. Now, uh, any more classified secrets you'd like to worm out of me? Oh, Billy. Billy, I love you so. What would I do without you? Johnny, come on. 23 months in action in the Pacific. I come out without a scratch. What could happen on a routine milk run like today? I know. I, I'm just being silly. Hold me a minute. Okay, Jirene's button it up. Your peerless leader has a few special words of wisdom for your ears alone. I'm going to brief you short and sweet on today's mission. This is no routine scout patrol. This is search and destroy. Destroy what, sir? I don't know. That's what I'm coming to. I hope nothing. But this morning, a couple of funny things turned up here in Area C, south and east of the Bermudas. Santa picked up some unidentified blips on the radar, which didn't act normal. They kept uh, flicking on and off the scope. Well, they were enough to set up a general alarm, and B-Wing was sent up on a scramble to fan out and intercept. They, uh, they didn't encounter anything. But two strange reports came back which we can't evaluate. One pilot claimed he sighted a kind of spinning disc at 11,000 feet. But when he tried to close with it, it shot straight up into the stratosphere and disappeared. Another pilot flying at 1,500 claims that about... 200 miles south of Bermuda, the sky suddenly went black above him. And below, the water was boiling white and eddying in a counterclockwise direction. By the time he called in two other planes for verification, the uh, wave formation, or whatever it was, had disappeared. And the sky was clear. Now, here's our mission for today. And this is how I want you to proceed. Wing Commander Little Eva. We're coming up 5,000. When we reach altitude, peel off and run through your own grid patterns at altitudes assigned. Uh, no communication during flight unless you have sighted something you can't handle. Oh, and in emergency, do not use regular code word for disaster or aid requests. Use Red Apple. Repeat, Red Apple. All aircraft acknowledge this message by the numbers as I request you to speak in. Coming up, number one. Over to you. Number 15, checking in, Major. Acknowledging instructions. Ready to split. Over. Roger, Billy Boy. Any questions? Over. Uh, you uh, really believe all this malarkey? Hey, I bet you two beers to one. This just turns out to be a routine patrol. Over. I just follow orders, and you'd better too, pal. I'm flying the course next to yours. Now, do me a favor. Get off the air. I need to talk to ground. Over. See you on the deck. We'll laugh at this. Over and out. <laughs> One bet I could take him up on. This is flight that leave at the tower. We are at 5,000, heading 6-0. Now departing traffic and leaving your frequencies. Going over to Am Center. Bye-bye. Expect us back as brief 1,700 hours. This is Little Eva saying so long. This is Wing Commander Little Eva to M Center. Over. This is M Control to Little Eva. Do you read us? Over. I read you, ground. What cooks? Over. All quiet here. We mark you all on radar. No other signs of activity. What altitude are you maintaining? Over. All aspects is briefed, unless you have other orders. The uh, three of us over the hot spot will maintain 8,000. 
There's no sign of anything unusual in the air or over the sea. Negative targets. We'll keep you advised. Over and out. This is uh, Billy 15 to number one, Little Eva. Do you read me? Do you read me? Over. Read you loud and clear. Why are you breaking silence? Over. I am northeast quadrants, uh, sector 5-1, south of Bermuda, a couple hundred miles, uh, second sweep on my grid, and I I don't like what I see. Over. Enough to break radio silence? Over. To right. Uh, where are you? Over. About 70 knots southeast of you, 8,000. Over. I, I, I don't know, Gil. It's, it's weird. I, I got this black mass sitting right over me, and, and below, the sea's gone all white and choppy. It's uh, kind of swirling like like maybe a submarine was surfacing. Only I want to tell you if it is, it is the biggest submarine you ever saw. Over. You hold on and keep circling. I'm coming your way. Oh, you, you better contact Adam Sander and alert them. You read me? Over. Yeah, I, I read you loud and clear, but I, I, I'm in real rough weather. Get, getting bounced around. Uh, you better contact Sander. I, I want to tell you, I don't know what's going on here. Over. This is M. Center Control to Little Eva Commander. Uh, communications to your uh, 15, Little Eva, interrupted. Uh, are you in his area? Over. This is Little Eva, number one. I'm heading his area. Everything normal here. What goes there? Over. Well, we don't know. We uh, we got a blip on the screen, unidentified, and he was on collision course. Uh, now it looks like he's circling target. Over. I told him to hold up, but he didn't acknowledge a sighting. You better contact him. Red Apple. Red Apple. I, I'm under attack, I think. I I, I, I don't know what it is. A, a thing like an enormous pot lid with no handle. It, it circled me, then stood on one edge. It, the, the thing went by me so close it nearly sheared off my port wing. That, now it, it's over me. Hovering. It's coming down. The, the, the compass is going haywire. This is M Center Control to Little Eva 15. Do, do you read me? Come in, Little Eva. Uh, little Eva 15, hang on. Help is on the way. Do you read? Over. I read you, but don't send help. No use. Nothing you or anyone can do. This, this thing is sucking me in. Swallowing me up. It's from our space. Our space. December 15th, 1946. Flight 17, on a routine mission out of Fort Lauderdale. Code name, Little Eva. One pilot and plane that never returned. Lieutenant Billy Howard, 26. Crashed in the area of water that was many years later to become known as the Bermuda Triangle. Or swallowed up through some time window into outer space and another world. It was to be over 30 years before there began to be any answers or explanations. I shall return shortly with some of them and Act Two. Whatever happened to Billy Howard? A Marine pilot flying a routine mission who disappeared as suddenly and mysteriously as though a hand had reached out of the sea or the sky and whisked him into some other dimension. Did he simply crash, as was reported to the public? Or were there reasons why his particular fate was hushed up and the true circumstances kept from his wife? Let's take one more look at his disappearance and then follow his story from 1945 to today. This is M Control Center to Commander Little Eva. What happened to your wingman? Uh, come in, over. Commander Little Eva, I'm central. I, I, I don't know. I had him in sight, but he just... He just disappeared. What can you tell me, over? Well, we had his blip on the scope. Uh, there was another unidentified blip on intercept course. They fused and went right off the screen. What, did he crash with something? Over. No, no, definite negative. No other craft within sight. He just... Well, what do you mean, disappeared? Uh, went into the drink, crashed in the sea? Over. No, he didn't crash. He just disappeared. Over. You had him in full sight? It happened before your eyes? Over. Well, there was temporary 
every cloud cover, not over 10 to 12 seconds. But when it cleared, he was... He was just gone. Over. So it's still possible he ditched. Over. No, no, no way I could see. I mean, I guess he must have, but, but it, it, it just isn't logical. There's no time. I, I, I'd have seen a plane, a parachute, something. I, I don't mind telling you, I'm getting the heebie-jeebies. You got any sightings there on the scope? Over. Negative. Just your flight wing, all coated. We are sending out PBY Air Sea Rescue to comb the area. Now check your position carefully and give me your best estimate of coordinates so we can zero in. And Major, button up on this. No leaks. It's stamped top secret. Coming. I'm on my way. Kill Shane. Where's Billy? Isn't he with you? Uh, Joan, could I come in a minute? There's something I... I knew it. Something's happened to Billy. What is it? Joan, if, if I could just step in for a second. Uh, yeah, yeah, all right. I'm sorry. Come in. Thanks. Tell me about Billy. What is it? He's hurt? Please tell me he's just hurt. He's not dead, is he, Gil? Please don't say that hey, he's dead. Hey, hey, take it just easy. Just tell me that he's not dead, please. Joan, I, I just don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I... I don't know what happened to Billy. If he's alive or if he's dead. At 1,500 hours this afternoon, 3 p.m. your time, Billy just up and disappeared. Disappeared? And is playing with him. I don't understand what you're telling me, Gil. I don't understand it myself, Joan. And I... I shouldn't be telling you this much. It's all supposed to be strictly hush-hush. And what about my husband? What about Billy? The official report will be that he crashed from some malfunction while on routine. Malfunction of what? The plane? Or Billy? Just that he crashed. Cars unknown. You ought to know you were there. I was and I wasn't. What does that mean? Well, just at the time I, I brought him in sight, there was some cloud cover in between us. By the time I got through it, Billy and his Corsair were just gone. But you didn't see him crash? No. Or him parachute out? No. The plane would sink, but maybe Billy's still floating in the sea no, somewhere. No, no, don't forget it. I circled that spot till they sent out our PBYs and even a mariner after that. Every square foot of that ocean, all the way to Bermuda, and within the parameters of any possible descent, has been, been scoured. One fact we have to face is that Billy is gone. But I won't believe he's dead. Can you honestly tell me he is? Joan, I... What do you want of me? I... Okay. Yes, I do. You're just like all the others. What others? The generals and the admirals, all the ones who are trying to hide the truth. What truth? That some other enemy got him, or somebody from some outer space or another world. They just won't admit it. Don't face it, how can they? There isn't enough evidence to go on. There's Billy. That's not enough. Not any evidence, really, just... just speculation. All right, I'll stick to that. At least if I do, I can still have some hope he's alive. Don't you? What can I say, Joan? <laughs> Planes, men, don't just disappear into thin air. He must have crashed. But you don't believe it all the way. I gotta believe it, or else I... Or else what? That some other world is invading us? Yes, anything like that. Every precaution is being taken. The whole service is on the alert. You don't have to worry that every step will be taken to make sure that we're in no danger. Has it ever occurred to you that these people, these extraterrestrial forces, might not be our enemies? After five years of war, I... I don't trust anything or anyone. So you want Billy to be dead? I have to be honest, Joan. Yes. Well, I don't believe he is. And I will never believe it till it's proven to me. I won't accept the fact that Lieutenant Billy Howard is dead. That was the 15th of December, 1945. It was to be over 30 years before I entered the picture. 
and the legend of Billy Howard started to be reestablished as fact. My name is Bryce Bond. I'm a lecturer, author, UFO investigator, and teacher of parapsychology. I'm also a practicing healer. It was a combination of the last three of these functions that drew me into Mrs. Howard's orbit. Or perhaps she into mine. A story had first come to my attention in the early 70s. The story haunted me. And in 1975, knowing that Mrs. Howard stubbornly refused to consider her husband actually dead, a group of 40 of us psychics decided to see if we could contact Billy Howard. What resulted from that had brought me now into 1977 to meet Mrs. Howard face to face. Are you Mr. Bond? I am. I've been expecting you. Won't you please come in? Oh, thank you. Oh, what an attractive house you have. It's grown through the years. Settled in. The garden is so luxuriant. I'd never be able to keep it under control if Charlie weren't as as avid a gardener as I am. Charlie? My husband. I'm sorry he's not home to meet you. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right, Mrs. Howard. Uh, but I guess that isn't your name now. No. It's Mrs. Murillo. I, uh... I thought it better with what we have to discuss that my second husband shouldn't be here. We have a screen porch. Shall we sit there? It's a little warm today. Okay. Wherever you choose. Then will you follow me? I followed this calm, controlled woman in her 50s to her house. A house that gave every evidence of being warmly lived in. Her figure was as neat and trim as that girl's over 30 years ago, who had said goodbye to a husband who never came back. I wondered if I was wasting my time. Or, more important, was I wasting hers and intruding on someone who seemed to have life under control and who was neither asking nor wanting any help or interference from me. I can't tell you what your letter meant to me. Oh, I'm, I'm relieved if you feel that way. Uh, under the circumstances, I felt that this might be an invasion of your privacy. Because I'm remarried? Well, yes. I don't think it is. I will neither defend nor apologize for what has happened in the 32 years since Billy disappeared. I am human. No woman wants to be alone. I have a wonderful marriage with a kind and gentle man. But we entered into it with everything in the open. Never mind the legal aspects. Even after all this time, I refuse to believe that Billy Howard is dead. And nothing I could say would change your mind? No. You're quite sure? Yes. Is that why you wrote and asked to see me? Yes. Uh, but of course I didn't realize that you had a whole other life. Don't you worry about that life. I can handle it. Tell me about Billy. Well, Joan, as I explained in my letter... In 1975, I read in a column in the paper a report that it was the 30th anniversary of Lieutenant Howard's strange disappearance. I had known the history of the case before, and, well, this was enough to trigger me into doing something about it. Doing something about it? Oh, a number of things. First of all, I did some deeper research on it. As you know, due to the late Brigadier General Gilshane's efforts, the files and all the reports of that mission were finally open to the public. Yes, Gil was marvelous about that for what good it did. You mustn't be bitter, Mrs. Howard. Oh, I beg your pardon. I suppose you just call me Joan, less confusing, and I'll call you Bryce. <sighs> that would help. Please go on. Well, I was just trying to say that you shouldn't be too bitter about the reaction of the authorities. It's one thing to be able to say that either by a malfunction of the plane or some mistake of the pilot, an unfortunate and fatal crash occurred. But to speculate on what really happened, that would be very difficult for established and ordered principle. What do you think really happened, Bryce? Now, for me, it's simple. I don't think. I know. What? What I told you in my letter. What 40 of us psychics have established and can prove. What you know you believe yourself. Or I wouldn't be here. That your first husband, Billy J. Howard, is still alive. For all her instinctive beliefs, Joan Howard is shaken to the roots. That this intangible ghost 
that had haunted her for over a full generation might suddenly become a reality. That at last she has found others who believe in what has only been a dream, vaguer and vaguer with passing years, is a shattering revelation. But she is committed. She must find out if and why it could possibly be true to justify the life she has led and try to face her future. I shall return shortly with Act Three. With Bryce Bond's quiet, positive announcement that her first husband is still alive, suddenly Joan is swept by forces beyond the iron control she has practiced all these years. She seems to shrivel suddenly, to become her age and beyond it, to be shaken and set adrift, reaching for any straw of reassurance to help her face the enormity of the belief she has nurtured in secret all these years, which now may become stark reality. You said 40 of you? There are 40 other people in the world that believe with me that Billy is still alive? That's right. I'm stunned. I, I, I don't know what to say. Where, where is he? Joan, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Why not? Oh, it isn't that I'm keeping any information from you. I have seen Lieutenant Howard, and I have talked with him. As have others. But exactly where he is could only be an educated guess. Why? Because he's not in our dimension. In our world. I, I just don't understand. Well, look, let me explain, Joan. You know, our world is not alone. There are other cultures, alternate realities, some of them living concurrently in the same time stream as ours. Others, like years ahead of us. I think you believe this, as I do. Yes, I do, but I... But let me finish, please. Now, these other worlds, many of them meet and relate to each other. We know, or can theorize this... Because dotted across our globe are convention spots, meridian points, window areas. Call them what you want. One of them is in the Sea of Japan, one in Arizona, one south of the Bermuda Islands. What is a convention spot or a window area? A spot where people converge from all levels, all dimensions ever so often. A mass movement of cosmic energies that causes a kind of an explosion in the physical dimension. This is all speculation, isn't it? I mean, it is not scientific fact. Oh, but it is. Sir Isaac Newton postulated that where energy and matter meet, there is created a timeless dimension called minus zero. What has all this to do with Billy? <laughs> well, your husband happened to be in the right spot at the wrong time. At the instant where all these journeys from alternate realities converged... There was a momentary physical convulsion of energy that opened a window to the unimagined. And in that instant, whoever was caught on the surface was sucked into the vortex through that window and trapped in a timeless void. And that's where Billy is now? Where he's been all these years? Yes. Oh, how awful, how terrible for him. No, don't, don't forget, he, he's in a different time from us. And remember, we have talked to him. Not only once, but twice. And although he is anxious to get back to you, he is far from unhappy. You have actually talked to him? It was because you finally went to APRO that I felt I had to get in touch with you. APRO? The Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Well, like so many organizations, the title is a jawbreaker, so we all use the acronym for it, APRO. You say you talked to him. How can you be sure it was Billy? Uh, we can't. Although he identified himself as Lieutenant Howard, we can't unless someone like you authenticates it. Me? How can I? I I'm not an authority. You are on Lieutenant Howard. Look, I won't bother you with the 40 original reports we had on meetings with him. But on the strength of those, recently, two of the psychics and myself made contact with him. But I don't ask you to take this on faith, Joan. I have solid evidence. Evidence? Yes. Let me refer to some notes we made. All right. Here. Your husband told us he was 
26 years old when he disappeared and that two days before the ill-fated flight was the anniversary of your first date, 10 years before. At Pasley's Diner on the corner of Plain and Elm Streets in Bloomsbury, Ohio. Yes, that's right. It was raining and he had a hole in one of his shoes. And you ordered Philly a soul. How could anyone else but Billy remember that? I'll tell you other things. He has a mole on his left shoulder blade and two scars. A little one under his eye where he got hit by a baseball and one alongside his right kneecap from having cartilage removed after a football injury. Yes. You were childhood sweethearts, never went with anyone else, were married before he joined the Marines in 1939. It was a civil ceremony, and he lost the ring and had to run out to the five and ten to buy one. After you were married, he brought you a real one and scribed, You'll never lose me. Love, Billy. And the five and dime when he wears around his neck to this day. How, how could you, how could anyone know all this? Only because Lieutenant Howard told us. Then he is alive. He really and truly is alive. But he, he's trapped in a timeless void. What can I... What can we do to get him out of there? You don't need any techniques, but love. I can help you relax, put you in a state of mind to be receptive to the waves of energy and electromagnetism from beyond. But I can't bring Billy back here. What would I do about Charlie? I'm... I'm married again. Perhaps you could go to Billy. Set his mind at rest. Oh, I... I... I'd be afraid to. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? It was late that afternoon that I left Joan Howard, now Joan Marillo, to call her by her second husband's name. I was in two minds as I drove towards the Miami airport. Would I and should I have interfered if I had known that she was remarried? But that was a decision really beyond me. As a psychic, I had responded to a distress signal from two worlds. I was only an instrument. The decision, not mine. I thought of Billy Howard as I had last seen him. Imprisoned in a sort of glass cylinder. Lost and alone. Seeking any communication with his lost wife. I would have been amazed if I had known what was happening in air traffic control in Miami at that moment. Lieutenant Colonel Banyan. I, I think you better get down here, sir. I got a bogey at 242 head and will not acknowledge. Now, I don't know who this lollipop is, but he's violating airspace. I'll be right down. Oh, should I sound a defense intercept? No, you hold it till I get there. Oh, Roger. But you keep after that lollipop. You make him identify himself. Affirmative. We'll comply. Uh, this is M Center. Aircraft on head and 242. Imperative, you identify. Give us your type and position. Uh, if unable to communicate, try to squawk us your 2011. Which way are you going? This is M Control to aircraft headed 242. If you do not identify... this bogey you were talking about. Uh, it's right there, sir. Uh-huh. All other planes are identified? Checked and double-checked. Now, this bar won't answer you. Maybe his radio is out. Maybe a lot of things, but that bogey is well inside the DZ. I'm going to send up... Hey. What happened to him? Well, I don't know. He... He just dropped out of sight suddenly right off the scope. Well, where'd he go to? Search me, sir. Unless he got below 800 feet, that would take him off the screen. You better hit the panic button. You scramble a DZ intercept. We gotta find him, whoever he is. At that moment, I could have found him for them. He went over my head, his exhaust roaring and leaving a trail of smoke behind him, coming in for a landing, heading north where I had just come from. The plane looked oddly old-fashioned, and a premonition came over me. I wanted to turn the car and follow, but strangely my engine had gone suddenly dead, and some inner voice spoke to me saying, Leave well enough alone. You know who it is and where he's going. Billy! Joan. Oh, you came back. Because you called me to. How are you, Joan? I'm... I'm well enough. You can see how I am. But you... Oh, I'm all right. You needn't have worried about me. I see that now. You haven't changed a bit. 
You're just the same as... as the day you said goodbye to me. You haven't changed either, Joan. Oh, <laughs> you don't have to be gallant. I'm an old woman. Oh, older, maybe, not old. What a wonderful thing that after all these years, your faith has helped keep me alive. Has it been so... so awful? Oh, not awful at all. And time is... different. It hasn't been long for me, preparing, getting ready for what I had to do. For what you had to do? Well, that doesn't matter at the moment. What's important is that you, that we are together again. Come with me. Where? To a whole new world that I'm just about ready to be accepted into. What sort of world? It's under the sea, on the ocean bed. That's why I've had to wait my time till I could learn to breathe and live there. Under the sea where? Where I disappeared. Down among the pyramids. Beneath what they call the Bermuda Triangle? Well, I don't know what my old world calls it, but it's love and happiness and peace. Come there with me. Oh, Billy, I can't. Our world has slipped us by. I can't come with you. Of course you can. Why do you think I was allowed to come back? Billy, it's too late. If I came back with you to your world, you would still be a young man and I would be a... a wrinkled old lady who could be your mother. Maybe even your grandmother. Joan... Don't you love me anymore? I love you forever. As I did when we were together. As I may in some future heaven. As I do now. In memory. But my love at last has its place. As yours must have for me. You and I are at peace. And it's time for us to say a real farewell. I'm glad I came back. So am I, Billy. It's time for you to leave. Yes. It's time. To the future. When we will all be rejoined again. The sky was suddenly full of jet planes. But I heard the individual sound of Billy Howard's plane take off behind me and roar over my head. At the same time, my car engine came alive again, and I continued on toward Miami. For the rest of the story, I pass on to use some army tapes which were made available to me. For me, they are an answer. For you, that you will have to judge for yourself. Do not take any direct action until advice from here. What is it? What you got now? Uh, boat, you there at 6 0. Colonel Benyon is heading out. <laughs> Who's that on his tail? F 15, Intercept Command. Pilot Pete Jacks. Let me get on the horn. What's his signal? Uh, Green Mac, Colonel. This is M. Sander, Colonel Benyon, the Green Mac. You read me, over. Uh, Green Mac, I'll read you, sir. Over. You are on the intercept course with a bogey. Have you sighted him? Over. Uh, just closing, sir. Weather is pretty dirty. Big black front sitting down. He is hard to identify. Over. Is he one of ours? Over. Uh, I don't know, sir. Over. Well, what's the matter with you? You can't identify your own craft? Over. Yes, sir. But uh, I know this sounds crazy. I think he's ours, but I never saw this kind of plane in the air. Only in books. It's a bluff plane, Colonel. And if you pin me down, I'd have to say an old Marine Corsair. Over. A Corsair? You mean... F4U? Over. Uh, yes, sir. F4U. It's hard to see because... Uh, I'm sorry. Extreme air turbulence. The sea. The sea. It's, it's crazy. It's like a volcano or something erupted underneath. It's it's all right. It's... This is M. Santa the Green Mac. Do you read me? Do you read me? Come sir. What? Look at the scope. They... Both disappeared suddenly. I, I don't mark them. But they can't have. They, what happened? I don't know, sir. I haven't any answers. Do we 
you have any answers? There are accidents. But what explains them? Are they just a statistical number that catches up with the random individual? Or are they, as Bryce Bond and others believe, the result of the meeting between other worlds which coexist with us? Are we just the skin of the onion and living as close to us as that skin beneath it, layer upon layer of other dimensions, are other cultures, other civilizations? That's up to you to decide. I'll be back shortly. And now, a preview of our next tale. Oh, yes, they'd be delighted for me to tell them of troop movements, secret dispatches, etc. Anything I wish, but Andre refuses to name any specific amount. But you ask for so little, 10,000 pounds. We'll write back to John Andre. Peggy... Draft up some letter about hats or gowns or whatever. I'll make notes on my views and perhaps, yes, give them some incidental intelligence just to whet their appetite. This messenger who's coming back, is our letter to be given to him? No, we're to tell him who in Philadelphia we're writing to. I'll write directly to John himself. Why not? You must be out of your mind. Write directly to Andre. Why, you might as well take your carriage and drive to British headquarters or shout our intentions from the housetops. This must be done in secret. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.